second panel discussion in the framework of this uh, uh, cultural mobility forum uh, held both in Tunis and online. Um, we salute all the newcomers, both in the room but also online, joining for this conversation. My name is Johan Flock. I'm the Director of Operations at On The Move, the international information network for artistic and cultural mobility. And for this panel, um, we have two distinguished guests that I'm looking forward to present you. This panel is entitled Greening Policies and Support Schemes. Um, the very uh, conversation we had a few minutes ago, I guess, opened already uh, many doors in relation to how do we perceive the role of funders and decision makers in not only a potential environmental sustainable plan or strategy, but also in the way we approach global uh, cultural relations. Um, to introduce this conversation, I just want to uh, quote a little facts that I will ask later on my two uh, uh, guests to comment and uh, elaborate upon. As you all know, probably at uh, international level, we have quite strong frameworks uh, in relation to uh, environmental sustainability. And at UN level, um, an immense work has been done to draw a map towards um, sustainable goals. As part of this strategy, uh, at uh, international level, many countries um, decided to embark on their own journey. Uh, commitment, taking measures, rethinking the way they operate or the way they support this change. At European level, uh, we have seen uh, a union of uh, member states that have decided to be very ambitious in the way they approach climate action and decided together to uh, elaborate a Green Deal that is putting in motion um, a plan to reduce the carbon footprint of all the European countries. As part of this changing the framework, um, we observe of course, the cultural field being also uh, embarking on the journey once again. And in this journey, um, the European Commission, responding to the European Parliament, decided to mainstream a lot of um, uh, environmental sustainability actions across all the European programs. So all the European funding program is supposed to somehow embed a climate action and reducing the carbon footprint of uh, all activities. Many ministries in charge of cultural affairs, uh, many arts councils, many private foundations also started to review the way they operate and to rethink their own strategy to somehow take into account these sustainable development goals at UN level, but also somehow also to echo what other states, uh, in particular European states, has been doing these past years, and I would even say these past months. What we observe is that uh, many studies, many organizations, uh, many players uh, start to develop their own toolkits, their own measures, their own criteria, and we have heard this morning some doubts or questions and concerns around these new approaches towards sustainable, uh, green sustainability. Yeah, you know, my English now is completely, you know, going outside. Huh? As you understand, I was not supposed to be on stage that long. <laughs> okay. Um, so we wanted um, today, after opening the door with the first conversation about the arts and arts making, um, of course, to continue with the conversation around funding programs, policy frameworks, grants, 
and how these environmental sustainability issues are reflected or taken into account into the work of these decision makers. Together with me, I have two uh, esteemed colleagues, and I'm very uh, happy to have you with me today. Um, uh, we have Arij Abu Ab. Arij is representing Alawet, which is a cultural resource, which is a player that is so important in the region, in the Swana region, and way beyond the Swana region. Um, Arij has studied in, fr in France, so I'm very tempted to speak in French with her now. <laughs> but, you know, I'm going to refrain myself. Uh, she studied uh, uh, um, uh, cultural history um, uh, of the Levant at the University of Lyon and also project management, cultural management leadership uh, in uh, Université Sorbonne Nouvelle in Paris. She has beyond working for this uh, uh, very important organization, has developed many projects uh, in Lebanon and, uh, 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 and in the Swana region. So I'm very happy to have you here with us today. And Karim, Karim Sultan, is based part-time in London, part-time in Tunis, and is a curator working for the Kamel Lazar Foundation. Um, Karim has been, uh, has been collaborating with the Kamel Lazar Foundation, especially for the curation of exhibitions and several programs. He is into music, so if you are into music, you really should uh, come and talk to Karim afterwards. Um, for this first, uh, for this uh, opening of the of this discussion, what I would like to ask our two uh, panelists here is to reflect very, you know, honestly on how this sustainable dimension is present in both their institutions. How far do they talk about it, reflect on it, and how far you already, you know, try to implement some of the ideas that we, you know, heard this morning. So, I don't know who wants to start with this. Maybe Arij? <laughs> Come on, Arij. This is you starting. Okay, so thank you, Johan. Thanks, everyone. Um, well, this is a big question to, to start with. Um, okay, so if, if I want to talk about culture resource, uh, the organization where I work, uh, I think the sustainability dimension is a daily question. And uh, the problem is there is no answer <laughs> to it. So it's just that in all the programs, whether grants or support programs that the organization provides, the main... Okay. So the main... Uh, it's fine? Okay. So, so the main... Uh, the main challenge is how to not limit the applicants, whether to the support or the direct grants, uh, to be limited in uh, the grant itself, in this uh, temporary support that uh, the organization can provide. And how the organization should be so close to these individuals and organizations and initiatives to work with them and not help them or enable them, but to work with them to imagine a more sustainable ecosystem where these individuals and organizations can actually grow. Because we all know that the, the need in the Arab region is way bigger than what is provided to the region, whether through international donors or through regional donors. So the need is so big that these individuals have, or organizations have this feeling that they got a one single chance to do a very ambitious project or career where we all know that this will be just one of the milestones and maybe one of the very early milestones they might achieve. So the question of sustainability for, for me and I think also for my organization is how to think together the sustainability dimension and not to digest what is being proposed as sustainability globally. Try to, 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 to imagine what, what, what this could mean in our context. Which is interesting because the approach is to work on sustainability in the broad sense. So not just the environmental one, but also the economic one, yes. the social one, and to try to embrace a more general overview of what is the pathway of exactly. artists, cultural developers, 
to be able to carry that on. Yeah, if I can add something. I don't know, maybe Karim would like to, but i just add a very short thing. And, and this brings us back to the morning session, the opening session, where the priorities are like, now is the, the, the right moment to talk about priorities because if we want to tackle sustainability from an environmental aspect, which is definitely very important, we live in this planet and we know the, the importance of it, and neglect the security level or the economy level or the like, continuous war in the region since 100 years, it would be impossible to prioritize the environmental question where people are not secure if they don't even move you know, like uh, being stuck. And th th this will bring us like to the priorities and not the priorities where again are suggested by the global discussions that, that are definitely very important to follow, but at the same time, the priorities and our own understanding of priorities. Sorry, Karim. <laughs> the idea of contextualization. Um, Karim, <coughs> and for the, the um, Camel uh, Foundation. Yes, of course. So thank you so much, uh, and uh, thanks to the organizers as well. It's, it's really a pleasure to be here, you know, sharing the stage with such wonderful people. So this idea of sustainability, in, you know, from, uh, from the perspective of the foundation, one can't help but think, uh, first, of, uh, first off, of sustainability in the sense of sustaining practices. You know, as a curator, I work with artists primarily on, um, and uh, work to represent artists. And, and so this idea of sustainability, the first thing that comes to mind is art practices are things that take uh, time, energy. These are things that need to be sustained um, on, a, on a regular basis. They're, they're very resource intensive. Um, and um, often, particularly in Arij, you were mentioning kind of the, the uncertainty and the precarity of the, of the context in which we're in. This is one of these things that we can't necessarily ignore. And so sustainability um, immediately sort of reflects or refers to this idea of how do we sustain these practices? How do we allow these artists or writers or filmmakers or theater makers, etc., uh, to continue their work um, despite the uncertainty and the precarity of the, of the context that we're in? And uh, of course, environmental sustainability is, is a part of it. Uh, we're right now in the city that we're in, in the country that we're in, is face, you know, facing, for example, water shortages. The fact that there's rain today, you know, there's a kind of, in London where I'm in part of the year, there's rain, it's, it's a little bit, uh, oh God, it's raining. But here it's like, it's raining, you know, there's, there's it's um, especially after the summer that we had last year, you know, these are, um, so the environmental aspect is, is part of how we, exist in our everyday life. It's something that we can't necessarily escape. But, uh, but as a, you know, a supporting, collecting, and, and programming institution, for us, this idea of sustainability, of course, the environmental aspect is there, but how do we keep these practices going? How do we make sure that the same artist will be able to get up the next day and continue their project? How do we work with them in, in thinking not just, uh, as you were mentioning, like, you know, just to sort of execute a project, but how do we think on a longer term, um, and even a historical one, which I'll get into later? No, thank you for this. I guess it is important also <coughs> to, f to, in a way, frame your action or to label the action and to be able to, in a way, um, um, see the terms you use also to define the impact you want to have on a local or regional ecosystem. Um, we prepared, uh, ahead of the, of the forum, um, a cultural mobility funding guide for the South Mediterranean region. And we specifically focused on the northern uh, Africa region. And we were struck with uh, many of the contributors, including uh, one of them, uh, Mehdi, <coughs> as them being in the room. Uh, we were struck that very few funding sources are taking into account the sustainability dimension. Uh, not only the broad one or the sustainability in a broad sense, but also the environmental sustainability. Uh, whether there were international funding sources um, trying to support the artistic community here, but also uh, local funders that were not mentioning the word, coming from a global north, uh, perspective and having in mind all these incredibly heavy green agenda on our shoulders. Um, we wanted to, to check with you too. 
um, how do you relate to this green agenda that many funders from the global north start uh, having and implementing? So, in a way, how do you perceive your colleague institution um, that are, you know, trying to change the, their modus operandi? Arij, um, no, <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to sort of jump in. And I, this is, of course, a back and forth. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I, we all have so much to say, I'm, I'm certain. So I think the, um, certainly, like the, the sort of the, the greening initiatives and the environmental initiatives and the sort of um, uh, the prioritization of, of, these, of these things is incredibly important. It's, uh, it's undeniable, I think, uh, to, um, to sort of circumvent them or to think around them. Um, I think, however, there are... Uh, numerous other concerns as well, like for example, Arij brought up security, for example, um, and uh, you know there's so many other things as well. I think, especially for example, like in you know from my experience in Tunis and, and other places in our broader neighborhood, um, because many of the kind of impacts that the climate catastrophe, uh, you know, the, the implications and the effects of them are things that you know, for example, the artists or the creative people that we work with are already living with. The scarcity of resources, um, inability to find materials, um, living in, 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 m in many cases, the uh, uh, living sort of the, 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 what do you call it, sort of the, the crest of the wave. Those things have already, you know, started to crash on the shores of, of places like, like here. So I think um, it's certainly part of the, part of the thinking and, and to see that there are institutions that this is becoming a more, let's say, widespread or more accepted uh, thing is of course extremely important. But I think the, for us, um, we're, we're of course thinking what's left out of that equation? What are the things that are not included as part of that, uh, that thinking or, the, or those kinds of initiatives? Um, yeah. Um, I don't know, I have a lot of thoughts actually in my mind. I think I will just share them out loud. Um, well, there are so many levels. I mean, in the organization, in our work, in the region, and the diaspora, of course, we try not to impose these agendas. Not because we don't believe in the like, uh, good cause of uh, having more uh, green thinking when it comes to uh, all our uh, cultural practices. But also, I think the, the cultural actors and practitioners should have their say, how they describe a greener world. Well, if, if this world would mean for them not to be, like to live in isolation, in, in isolated environments where they have so many restrictions already and we are just adding another layer of restriction for them, for them to be, uh, more beautiful in the eyes of, <laughs> of, the, of the decision makers, like the global decision makers, it would mean we failed our mission in the region. And at the same time, if you want to look at the needs of these practitioners and to try to put our voices all together when it comes to these green thoughts, I think we might have so much to say that is not even said in these uh, approaches. For example, all the local artists who work with the very raw material they have in their environment, which is something very pretty much spread in the region because of the lack of accessibility to more produced and processed material, which means instinctively they have this green approach. If I'm just, maybe I'm reducing the term a little bit, but just to, to give it a thought. And if we look at all these uh, organic and natural accumulation of knowledge that these artists have inherited and they are trans trans transmitted to others with a very uh, minimum amount of uh, visibility. I think they are doing with a pretty much simple tools that they are not uh, actually harming the globe. <laughs> and in this sense, it will bring me again to the very first uh, conversation we had, I think, last year <laughs> on this uh, on this issue, who is polluting what and why we should pay for it. And when we say we, again, I know that I understood the we that was tackled in the morning, but there is so many layers, there's so many we's in this we that we should tackle, I think. 
it's good to have a big we, like a capital we, where we can all discuss together, knowing that there are nuances in this we that will, will force us to understand that there are so many we's, actually, where every one of us as communities should really uh, be able to at least start by understanding their context to be able to contribute to, to, to this bigger we that is very conscient, but at the same time is very critical to what is being imposed. You know, I don't know if, uh, <laughs> if I confused a little bit, but yeah, I, I try to share my thoughts uh, as they are. <laughs> no, but thank you. This is, uh, this, is exactly, uh, this is exactly what we expect from you. Huh? <laughs> um, look, uh, what's interesting, I mean, if I, I have, there are many ideas that I, I would like us to delve into. Yeah. Uh, also because they resonate with some comments that we heard this morning in yeah. terms of the knowledge and who gets to share the knowledge. Um, in terms of the we against they, which is also some thought we, we heard. The yeah. Who is the we and who, who are the, the they that we try to you know, put in another field or box, whatever. Um, also because you talk about this um, idea of fighting isolation, which I think resonates to in the hearts of all of us in terms of how do we make sure we connect uh, makers, artists, cultural managers, etc. But also you introduce an idea that I think also resonates a lot with the room and probably with the participant online is the notion of they have a say, they have needs, that we need to cater. And the we, again, multi-layered, complex, but the notion of having a dialogue with local cultural scenes to be able to collect the needs and be able to build whatever strategy with capital S and uh, grants with capital G, etc. And I'm wondering how far do you enter into this dialogue what are the processes for you as an institution to actually collect these needs and make sure that nobody's left out, to use the word? Huh? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, of course, uh, like, uh, if, if you want to, to say it with the absolute thinking we have, we will definitely say that we try as much as we can to grab the, these needs, to, one being based on the region, which means a lot of the practitioners, the artists, the individuals, the collectives we know, uh, they are from the network and we work together at a certain moment. So we just have the circulation of needs that we all have together. This is a part, but actually to be very also realistic, we know that what we can get and what we can understand, it's, it, it's already at the level of individuals, practitioners, organizations that, that, that are above the line, to be very honest, to be very realistic as well. Like we know that we cannot reach artists who are located in rural areas and who didn't have any initiative that would push them a little bit into the light so a pan-Arab organization can see them. So to be very honest, we will never pretend that we are actually at the needs of everyone in the region and the diaspora and so on. One, because our resources are not what, uh, what everyone would imagine, that <laughs> the resources are uh, huge. The resources are always limited. Uh, and the criteria is getting tighter on every one of us, of course. At the same time, we know that the short of staff in such organization, you definitely you relate, <laughs> of course. The, 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 the short on staff, the short on resources, the, the, the capability of doing limited programs in age and uh, duration means that this need will be like um, partially understood. But at the same time, if our ambition is to work with this, with this little that we know, it means that we are trying to get more. And this is our approach, actually, in, in the organization. We try to be as close as possible from uh, all the like, actors, practitioners, and we try to learn on the go. So we have, it's been almost 20 years for our organization. And through these years, I'm quite sure that things have developed. Like, we don't have the same 
uh, look at the region that we had in 2003 when the organization was established. And this learning, this collective learning, this uh, peer learning that we have with all our, we call them also partners, like the, the, also the, the grantees, we call them partners when we do projects together. This learning is accumulating, but we are always, uh, how do we say it? There is, there is always one lab that is before of us all, that is the limitation of our resources. So we try to learn, we try to understand, but we always know that what we can actually do to have these connections inside the region is all the time, or, or at least for, for now being, it's being limited and it's always under what is really needed in the region. So we are short on this, of course, and it's, it's, we have to admit that we cannot like cover it all. At the same time, on international level, with the diaspora, of course, but also with international partners, we try to, to have this, um, how do we say, this uh, ongoing conversation where I don't, I don't like to see it personally like the South is talking to the North. I don't like this, and why should we like uh, surrender to this idea of forever South and North? <laughs> it, it feels weird. And um, I know, of course, that the, there is this dynamic of power, but being ourselves in our region, the power is ours also. And like, uh, it wouldn't be correct for us to say that we're trying to understand our needs while we just uh, listen, uh, or in the better, uh, best uh, scenario, teach the North of what we need. I don't think this is uh, correct <laughs> in, in our uh, context. No, no, it's interesting also as a positioning even to, to like reposition yourself in your no. own environment no. and not let an external uh, definition uh, comes to, you know, um, uh, disturb in a way yeah. uh, a practice or an, an agenda, a general agenda that you may have. It is interesting, this question of agenda is also, mm. uh, the idea of not imposing an agenda. Um, maybe many uh, players uh, in Europe, at least, have sometimes the feeling or the frustration to have an imposed agenda, an imposed green agenda. And as far as I understand, in the Kamel Lazar Foundation, through the various programs you have, both you know, curating um, um, visual arts projects, but also welcoming artists um, in residency programs, supporting by mobility grants, etc. I don't feel you have a specific agenda in, in relation to imposing certain lines. But yeah, certainly. <laughs> no, that's um, <clears throat> that's actually um, it's a very important point. So for us. So actually, there's maybe a couple of points that I just wanted to touch on for, from Arija, actually. And I think there's one of the things you mentioned, for example, um, and hinted at, I think, this, this sort of um, capital city syndrome, let's call it, this sort of thing where for, where, for example, whether it's Cairo or Tunis or wherever it is, tends to get a lot of the attention and the resources. It tends to be, and maybe this is part of the, the post-colonial condition, this is how these the states have formed. Um, we can get into that. That's another conference that we need to have on this. But, um, but, so, this. So, when when understanding the cultural landscape and the needs, I think of of various cultural actors, artists, or practitioners throughout a country, um, rather than having a kind of like a scientific, you know, a, a approach where, for example, the culture happens in the city and everything else is something to be studied. Um, to actually see the entire, you know, from the smallest town to the biggest city as a place in which practices emerge, which require support, which have attention, which are seen as equals, is a good, perhaps a, a place to start from. You know, this is a suggestion. Of course, I think we all kind of have this uh, capital city syndrome in many ways. But, um, but maybe that's, that could be an interesting suggestion of a place to start, to see, for example, like what's happening in, in a smaller town, in a smaller city outside of, uh, outside of the capital, and, and using that to realign our, our priorities. But in terms of agenda, I think, um, certainly, we, there are, I think, um, maybe biases, maybe certain directions that we want to go in, certain priorities. But having, for example, a fixed agenda of this is exactly what we want from this program, I find a little bit limiting, personally. And I think, uh, you know, from, from the institution as a whole, there's a, what you could call a kind of experimental approach. And that's, you know, uh, maybe you might want to call it an ad hoc approach, but where there's um, an addressing of particular needs, of, of listening, of seeing, uh, what the priorities are of the moment, what are the concerns of the moment, but then 
thinking how we can transform them into longer term um, longer term programs or longer term projects or actually seeing for example something through if uh, if for example an artist you mentioned the residency program if we have you know actually in a couple of days we're going to be welcoming uh, our current exhibiting artist Lydia Rahman uh, to um, to Tunis and for an artist like that to come to you know our neighborhood um, is quite significant you know somebody who has connections to the sort of the broader region that we're in how do we actually connect artists who are working here with an artist like that? How do we sort of make sure that, I mean, this is a, such an overused term like impact, you know, it's not my favorite word, but, um, but how do we sort of actually develop these very genuine connections? How do we put these people together in a way that it's not just about having the nice photo and, but, you know, for example, to Maybe instead of impact, it's about you know building these kinds of longer-term relationships to to see how these things can sort of develop in the um, how how you know uh, things can change in 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 the longer term. How um, there's so much I want to say, and it's all coming to my mind at once. But uh, uh, but yeah, I'll sort of pause there for a moment. And yes, but uh, it is, it is interesting to see, and that's why I, I, I always go back to the pronouns. You know, I mean the we, they, etc. Because, I mean, what I hear, I don't know about the participants, are two institutions that are very concerned about the arts and the making of the arts and the production, distribution, uh, the connection, etc. And try as much as they can, considering their capacities, to try to take into account or to cater for the needs of not only artists but also a local community. Um, doing this, you have also to design programs, you know, to design open calls for participation, to collect applications, to evaluate these applications, to find criteria and try to apply them. So you, from this genuinely well-intended goal to support the artist, you need or you decided to go through this process of selection and criteria, etc. I understand from your, to, your two uh, um, uh, presentations, but also having in mind the words of the first panel, that imposing criteria that would be green criteria wouldn't be not only relevant, but also quite, uh, yeah, let's not qualify this <laughs> idea. It would be quite uh, crazy, let's put it this way. But at the same time, defending sustainability you could come up with sustainable features in your programs and make sure that, no matter how we call it, cultural impact or mm. whatever we call it, but at least this idea of sustainability, uh, working conditions of artists, etc., are, you know, uh, actually a practice that you push forward. So without having a, an agenda that is uh, green-specific, but at least sustainable specific. And I don't know if you have already such features to ensure the sustainability of the cultural scene, but how do you respond to this? Yes. Yeah, so actually just um, kind of a, a brief interjection. So I think this is certainly, I think, um, I mean, it's something that we discuss. It's part of our, uh, it's part of how we produce, for example, in the production of an exhibition. I know there's other panels and, and discussions that's going to be discussing this, but, but just to kind of uh, drop this in there. But certainly, I think the environmental impact, I think greening, just to, uh, maybe this is a, uh, a small semantic point, but, um, but it's, uh, I think the environment has a number of different colors, and I think green is sort of one of them. Um, <laughs> but... Uh, like for example, the the not to, you know for a shameless plug, but the exhibition we have on now currently uh, by Lydia Rahman uh, Tassili um, is set in the in the sort of the protagonist of the of the film is the is a incredible plateau in the southeast of Algeria, which is it's a very kind of fragile ecosystem, and it's um, uh, the colors are a bit different than me, but uh, but but sorry, just a semantic point, but. Uh, um, but in terms of, for example, the production of exhibitions, and you know, especially when it comes to travel, when it comes to a number of different things, but just as an example of the production of exhibitions, um, for us, the, the use of materials, the use of, for example, transportation, uh, flights, 
Um, all of these things, the environmental impact is, is part of the conversation you know, we have in the office or over our emails, um, which is, you know, for example, how do we reuse materials? And, and part of it is to do with the kind of uh, ecological and, and environmental conversation, but part of it is also to do with the scarcity of, as Arish uh, was hinting at earlier, a kind of scarcity of materials, which has a, a sort of this dual thing. On one side, it's incredibly wasteful, especially like with scarcity of certain materials like wood, for example whose price has increased exponentially over the past couple of years. Um, so there's this kind of, this correlation. The environmental impact has a direct economic impact as well. You know, the price of certain materials or the, the, the you know, suddenly something one year is, is available, the next it's not. And it's, it's, uh, it's not just a matter of, okay, we'll find somebody to ship it in. But it's like, okay, how do we work within these limits? Uh, and, and the environmental aspect is part of it, but the economic and the scarcity is the other. So it's... Uh, I would say that, uh, and you know, when it comes to grant applications or reviewing um, uh, calls for support uh, and these kinds of things, um, for us, this idea of, like we were mentioning earlier about impact, it's you know, for us, it's a, it's an incredible privilege to have somebody who's managed to actually get through, you know, go get on a plane, get through two different airports, so much paperwork, um, and for them to be, for example, in Tunis to work, that means that this is like a this is a privilege, this is actually like an incredible thing. Um, so how do we make the most of it? Maybe the, the ecological terminology is not there, but it's part of the, the thinking, and it's determined by the, the kind of limitations that we're working within. So. Yeah, I, I think it's a little bit on the same sense uh, in, in the selection process. Well, first of all, I think one of the keys for this thinking is the, the diversity of programs which means, for example, for the mobility grant, Wujhat program, the application is very basic and simple. It does not recommend any complexities for the applicant because we already know that it is already complex for any artist or practitioner to apply for, uh, already to get an invitation to be invited somewhere. So the, the application is really very simple and basic. The selection process is very simple and basic. Uh, the main question that is usually uh, tackled by the jurors, because they are independent jurors, not the team, of course. We don't do the selection, we just do the facilitation. So the main question is, how is this travel relevant for this applicant? And usually the answers vary between either it's their first encounter, so it's important in itself for them to move, to be able to attend something, to contribute, to visit, another place, another location. So this would be in itself important for them. Or if the artist or the applicant in general, they could be groups because it's individual and groups applications. If for them it's, it's not their first, it's not their very like uh, uh, first encounters, the questions become more complex for the jurors. What does it mean for this group or this artist to go to this place and contribute to this action? So it's just, uh, uh, this is just to give you a, an idea that the, the discussions are not uh, linear. They are really complex when it comes to the selection. At the same time, we have this basic line in, in, our, in all our programs to have this geography and gender balance. So we definitely receive applications that are not balanced. For example, I can give an example. It's always... Uh, Egypt, Morocco, uh, the, the highest percentage of applications, but we make sure that they don't get the highest percentage of grants. Not because we don't want them to uh, develop much more their work, but just usually the jurors, when they receive uh, an application from Mauritania or Yemen, everyone is intrigued to see, let's make this possible, you know, because we know that people there have less chances, they have less opportunities, and they need to get this push further to be able to develop their work. This is from on, on one hand. On another hand, there is this uh, encouragement that we try to do in each round of Ujhat, is to encourage people to move within the Arab region. Because maybe you all know this, but to get an, uh, a bunch of artists from the region to meet in Europe is much more easier than to get them meet in Tunis or in Beirut, we won't say in Sudan, we won't say in Yemen, in Mauritania, where it becomes impossible for them to meet. So for us, we try always in each round to encourage, to give grants for people moving 
regionally, inside the region, for this exchange to keep on happening. On the other hand, when it comes to other programs where the fund is much more for a structuring organization, like Habara program, the application becomes more complex because the answers should tackle the idea of long term. We know that the mobility in itself, it has a long term impact, but we don't ask the artists when they apply to have an answer of what is the long term impact on their work becomes obsolete for them. Like, I want to go sing there. I don't know what would happen next. <laughs> like, maybe the festival will be canceled, but it's just an opportunity that I might have. But for an organization or a collective that is trying to be more structured, and I, I say structured I, between brackets, because they might be interested in getting structured in the traditional structure way, or in the new thinking of getting organized without these uh, traditional hierarchical ways, then these collectives should be part of our collective thinking altogether on how do we see ourselves as organizations or as an ecosystem of individuals and organizations. So, so in, this, in these programs, the, the idea of support will be much more complex because it has a promise of reflecting on all the sector and not only on an individual or one group benefit. It is interesting also the, the thinking behind the, I mean, the ambition of the schemes in a way. Yep. Um, um, I mean, working a lot uh, with the team of On The Move on all the mobility funding available, not only these calls that we publish, but also the guides that are so important. We see that uh, many of the features, including the ability to go back to uh, a, a context we visited, that the grants are not just one-off, um, that you know, uh, uh, new ways to collaborate internationally are, um, are taken into account are very important. Um, before opening the floor and welcoming comments from the room, but also from, uh, from our online platform, I have just a, a last very short question for you. Um, what is your wish, actually, uh, as institutions, um, I mean, apart from having more money to spend, <laughs> because I, I guess we can all agree we could enjoy uh, like a lot of money to spend. But about, apart from this, uh, in relation to this environmental sustainability um, aspect, um, do you as an institution would, would you like to, like to imagine something special in relation to this? Aha. Huh? <laughs> the last minute trick. You know, this, yeah. is <laughs> this is the drop uh, quiz, you know. Exactly. <laughs> they have this we answer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, actually, um, I, 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 I think that's, it's, it's a question because we're now preparing with the sector to not to celebrate, but to, 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 to live together this 20th year of cultural resource. And I think we, <laughs> we are all like uh, struggling with this answer of, What's the meaning of it all? And this where comes the wish, I think. Uh, to be able to have maybe, uh, like, like we've been in, in, in the region, of course, you all know you have also maybe uh, similar contacts. We've been in struggles for so many years that sometimes we lose the meaning, we lose the, the direction why we're doing all this, like why we are really fighting demons <laughs> all the time. And then, I think the wish is like not to, not to overcome these struggles because it also shape us and make us what we are. And this is uh, something very important not to be outside ourselves. But at the same time is to be able to have this collective imagination working again. I think we are in a very turning point in our region, maybe also globally. I understand the war in Europe is now at the door. So <laughs> Uh, and I, I saw the faces when the, 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 this question was uh, asked in the morning. And I was like, everything we might say in our region might look inhuman for, for Europe today because we've been in this struggle, in these wars for so many years that we try to, to not to say like, uh, and we survived because we might, uh, we might have lost so many things that we could have done if we did not have these wars. But at the same time, try to see how this sector, uh, the culture and art sector in the region, in the Arab region and beyond, because now so pe many people are interested in these discussions, 
how can we imagine collectively a future that um, that wouldn't put us in a, rea a reaction position all the time. Like, we have an, a question and we have to answer. <laughs> and all the time we try to fit in and fit in and getting tighter all the time. So how, how about we don't have these limitations, at least in our discussions, at least in our approaches to each other? I think that there is an opportunity, not because the struggle is today global. I don't wish this to anyone, of course. But uh, because today people are getting the sense that the danger is so close, uh, we've been saying this for the past 100 years, <laughs> it's so close that the existence in itself should make a point, or even it will be just another uh, cycle of uh, terror. Certainly, yeah. And it's, um, <clears throat> no, uh, that's, that's, uh, that's an important wish, I think. And, and for me, I think sort of, let's say, as a, as a counterpoint to that. Um, I think if it's sort of in an ideal world, that's sort of the question, right? Sort of what the, the wish is. I think, so no matter, despite a lot of these situations, a lot of the, the circumstances, the challenges that, that many of us collectively face, uh, particularly in, in sort of our neighborhood, um, still somehow artists work. They make work. They see things. And they, not to sort of like, uh, overly valorize the, the work of an artist, but but something allows you know the writer, the photographer, the the, the, the you know filmmaker, whatever it is, um, to look at their environment and imagine something a little bit different, or to see something in it, and to use what's around them in particular ways, and uh, to create meaning from them. Um, and so, but at the same time, this person, these individuals or these collectives are in some of the most precarious situations, and they're the sort of the people who have to sort of do you know, double work, as they, as they say, to, to be seen, to, to have their voice heard, and the number of uh, barriers that they have to face in order to actually do what they do is, is immense. And so I think, and this was something that was touched on earlier, which is basically like, you know, there's an expectation of the artist to also be the kind of, um, to sort of say a lot of uh, what we want them to say. But I think, um, if I can just tell a little kind of small anecdote about to do with more mobility and, and this sort of this thing of, of what the artist can do. So um, one of my favorite artists uh, from the mid 20th century, an Iraqi artist, Shakir Hassan Al Said. Um, this was an era where, for example, uh, the Iraqi Development Board was, uh, was sending people sort of internationally uh, to study, uh, you know, around uh, in Europe and around the Arab world. And a bit earlier, Egypt was doing something similar. And Shakir Hassan Al Said was somebody who grew up. Um, with this idea that of, of, a, of a kind of irreconcilable difference between, for example, art from Europe and art from the Islamic world, let's say from the broader uh, Islamic world, if you want to be a historian. Um, and in that European art had perspective, you could paint people, you could, you know, uh, um, whereas in Islamic art it was only calligraphy and abstraction. Somehow he ends up in a trip, he's, he's studying and teaching in, in Paris, he goes to the Bibliothèque Nationale, and he finds uh, a copy, an uh, illuminated manuscript of the Maqamat al-Hariri. And this is a, this is a, the Maqamat al-Hariri is, you know, a collection of like satirical and everyday poems, and and it's painted by a painter called al wasit And this was a shock to him. He's he's looking at this and basically saying, you know, these are scenes of everyday life in Baghdad from a thousand years ago, his hometown. He's but uh, and everything that he was taught was sort of a lie, like uh, that they're painting people, there's these funny scenes, there's you know, um, everyday life depicted. And so for him to go to another city, um, to find in, hidden in some library as a kind of academic curiosity, something that overturned everything about what he believed an artist to be, allowed him and his group of people, the Baghdad Modern Art Group, to basically reimagine what it meant to be an artist from this particular place happened by, almost by chance, by accident. Um, and this allowed him and his group, incredible group of artists and architects and writers, to feel that they were part of a history. And in fact, uh, Jawad Salim, another artist who was part of this group, said something like, you know, by discovering this, we've reconnected this you know, 800 year old gap in, in what it means to be an artist, a painter. Um, and this happened from him traveling, moving to another place, uh, being mobile, having the, the, the ability to do so, with the support of, uh, of uh, for example, government grants and private patrons and things like this. So I think this is what you're mentioning something about that you can't necessarily impose an expectation of what 
this happened by, by chance, but to give the time and the space and to have the kind of the, um, to elevate the status of the artist. That's sort of my very long answer. So yeah, thank no, you. But thank you for, for this great anecdote and, and thank you also for these important words uh, describing uh, a specific context and situation. This is the moment then um, I will have colleagues uh, circulating in the room with mics and uh, also having uh, online participants uh, um, posting comments, uh, reactions and questions to our panelists. Um, who wants to take the floor? Again, please raise your, your hand um, high up so I can see you. Oh, come on. <laughs> Nobody wants to talk to the funders, really? <laughs> <laughs> Juliana, could you please also present yourself so we keep track? <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, now it's working. Uh, so, hello, good morning. This is Giuliana Ciancio from Italy. I'm representing Living, an organization, Italian-based organization. Uh, so, we work a lot on uh, supporting cultural organizations in uh, cultural cooperation processes internationally. So, with all the limitations and the fights and uh, the needs that has to be observed. And uh, I want to really thank you very much for... Um, uh, and also for this morning panel, because I think that there are, you know, many, many connections. So I have many ideas that I would like to share, but uh, I will try to be very short and, and uh, precise. So uh, the first thing that came to my mind while you were speaking is, um, uh, yeah, is the empirical dimension that maybe we really need to uh, use more and more when we speak about policies when we speak about, um, you know, uh, sustainability, and when uh, we speak about to rethink also the power relations in, uh, in uh, policy context and political context. You were speaking about uh, experimental, but maybe I would like to call it empirical in the sense that really the experience and really the connection with the ground, with the bottom-up expressions can uh, really help us in rethink and looking at power relationships. And then secondly, what came to my mind, that actually we were speaking about sustainability under the environmental uh, viewpoint, under the economical viewpoint, but maybe we are speaking about sustainability under the political viewpoint, which is the topic nowadays. So what does it mean to uh, look at the policies uh, as a political tool, which is nowadays more than ever urgent, no? so replacing it as a, really uh, a political means for reorganizing and also for, as you were saying this morning, no? reclaiming uh, um, uh, balances that are between the global south and the global north, but is also r related to uh, social groups uh, accessibility, economical accessibility, and uh, um, you know, class matters of class, because this is also something that create our societies. So, yeah, my question is, in your opinion, how we can have uh, tools for having more empirical policy developments in a cooperational? perspective. So, trying to be short. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you, Juliana. I don't want if one of you is inspired and want to answer this or comment. Uh, yeah, maybe it's not, uh, it's not an answer. It's, it's just a, a comment. Thank you for... Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, in, 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 our, in our work in the organization, we have the cultural policy program. It's been running since 2009, and things have changed so much over the, the, the years of this uh, program. So uh, there was, I think there was, uh, just trying to understand how it built up in the region. So there was this uh, belief at the very beginning, at the launch establishment of this program, 
there was this belief that we should work on uh, creating policies and applying and uh, like uh, presenting policies in a very, um, um, I don't know, moment where uh, everyone in the region thought that the governments and states are reachable. <laughs> so people were working on this. There were national groups working on this, uh, also Arab uh, network working on this, with this idea of being able one day to present these policies. In some places, it reached some higher ends. In other places, it, it stayed at the level of discussions. And today, uh, after all these years with this program, we have two lines in thinking of this. We have the line where we keep on providing information. So we keep on having publications on the situation, on the topics uh, that we think are or researcher thing that are priorities to tackle, like the, the funding, like the digital sphere, and so on, everything that is related to policies. And on the other hand, we're experimenting also with this uh, bottom-up uh, experimental white paper where we are trying to discuss not only uh, priorities, but also what, the, what these terminologies would mean, actually. Starting from ecosystem to cultural policies, where for a reason or another, all these terminologies uh, were for us were just uh, important, you know, how the differences of languages, and we are all trying also today to find our words in another language. And it applies to the, the, to the policies. Like, it's been so many years that we're looking at the policies in uh, the eyes of fixed terminologies that are brought from very successful uh, trials uh, done in other countries. And none of these countries are, are in our region, <laughs> like uh, practically. Oh, or maybe practically they are, but like theoretically they are not. So, <laughs> so uh, that we've lost a little bit the meaning of the sense of what do we actually need by thinking of uh, policies. So uh, f for me, the tools should be as experimental in the future as the very first idea of what does all this mean. Like, definitely today, we need to create our own tools. Uh, and it starts with def defining our own terminology and not only translating term terminologies. So th this is one of the ideas that came to my mind. I, don't, I know it does not answer at all, but I think it's just a shared idea also on this. Thank you. Thank you for this. Um, on the, um, do you want to add something? Oh, um, I, 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 I agree. I think there's, <laughs> <laughs> there's, no, there's uh, more seriously, I think there's a lot. I think um, on one side, you know, this idea of, of having a, a sort of a toolkit or best practices of how um, these things should work is, of course, incredibly important. But I think there is also the need for flexibility and an ad hoc kind of uh, approach, the sort of uh, you know experimental approach, and then using those things to measure. Um, but uh, there's almost a sense of uh, using this term again, like double work of trying to build something from each context. And uh, especially, I think the work that you do with with Modit and kind of having this broader uh, regional approach is incredibly important because we we have you know a lot of we this, uh, this very troubling pronoun comes back, but, uh, but there's a number of things in, in our sort of broader neighborhood that only reflect what we have to deal with, so I think it's, yeah. Well, okay, okay. Um, I know there are some mobility funders in the room, and I don't want to name names, but <laughs> this is the moment you can take the floor also to share your own views and perspectives on uh, sustainable mobility. Um, Marie, I don't know if we have some comments from uh, online participants that you would like to share? Hello, yeah, it works. Uh, there was one uh, question, but in fact, uh, to, many ex to much extent, even though we could continue the conversation, I think Ari should answer it, because the question uh, echo very much the, the comment by Juliana, how can sustainability be ensured in the cultural field with, oh no, sorry. Uh, this is another question. Uh, how can a relation between Arab countries be developed in the cultural and artistic field between government, non-profit association, and artists? So this was one of the questions, maybe to some extent. Yeah, uh, well, well, this uh, might be the like, uh, utopian <laughs> idea of having uh, all these people talk together. Because I think that the, the, maybe it, it, it definitely it is different from one country to another in the region, but 
I think we are all at this, uh, maybe, it's, I, I, won't, I won't like uh, call it a dead end, but I think we are at a very critical turn, turning point where um, uh, governments are struggling. Uh, they, they, don't, uh, they don't have uh, capacities and uh, imagination to think of uh, this uh, bunch of people they are running. And uh, the civil society is uh, limited by itself and in itself in close circles. So they, they also, they, there is this inner struggle in the society. And uh, I think there are so many, uh, so many sources of, uh, of uh, problems today in the region that makes the discussion to have a fruitful thinking together is a little bit, uh, Impossible, I think. But at the same time, uh, it, it, it might bring us to a question also. Do we need to, to have these, uh, like theoretically in policies, we have these factors that we think these are the stakeholders to think of policies, to have clear and fair and just policies, of course. But are we at this, uh, at this point today, are we in this position where all our energy should be put to have this discussion or it's a moment, it's a chance where we can think outside of it all and try to, to find new ways of organizing ourselves and uh, getting uh, collective rights, for example. I don't have an answer, just like I think that this is where, uh, where this question might, might be uh, accurate also. Thank you for this. Um, one last comment. Uh, yes, Ukona. Um, so one of the many things that occupies my mind because it's my lived experience is cultural mobility and parenting, specifically mothering in the broadest, most gender expensive use of that term. And uh, how, and I was excited to see that on the move has started those conversations, but it's a very particular way of having to navigate life, uh, working in the sector while you're doing the mothering thing, and, and while also feeling quite um, entitled to this idea of mobility. And, and to, I'm putting it to the room for whoever it is that sits in the policy, decision-making, imagining space to kind of begin to keep that in mind, to to realize that in 2023, it's a shame that it's an unspoken agreement that you must figure it out and not inconvenience anyone and appear in order for you to remain relevant in the sector. When we see in other sectors conversations around how to consider this lived reality of many yeah. of us. And it shouldn't feel like punishment to, yeah. to want to pursue family life while working in the sector. Thank you for this uh, comment. Yeah, we are working on this issue very much uh, at On The Move. So uh, hopefully this year we will be continuing to publish uh, material about it. And uh, hopefully many funders will commit to work on this issue too, actually. Mm -hmm. I want to thank you both. Uh, Arij, thank you very much thank for you. joining this conversation. Karim also. Um, a lot of thank you for you know sharing your thoughts, but also examples and and practice. This is what we need. I want to thank all the uh, participants in the room, but also all the participants online. I will close this panel, um, and as you understand, many of these ideas will continue to be discussed uh, uh, tomorrow for. Uh, the other panels that we will be proposing. Thank you. I will now uh, give a round of applause to both our speakers. <laughs> and I will welcome uh, Marie back on stage as uh, she will be leading the, the last uh, segment of this uh, morning. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. I will not be alone on stage, and in fact, I will not be the one to speak so much. Uh, I would like to invite Leila Bengasem to come with me, please. Thank you. That's amazing. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you very much. We are very glad to have uh, Leila Ben Gassem with us uh, today and tomorrow. So, first of all, um, uh, I will introduce Leila, I think, for the Tunisian art and cultural sector and also social entrepreneurship sector. Uh, Leila is very well known. But um, you have a biography uh, in the program, but I will just remind, I'm always impressed by people who are working and involved in the art and cultural sector, cultural heritage, but started with a BS in, in biomedical engineering. It's amazing how many people did engineering before and are now in the art and cultural I sector. I forget that sometimes. <laughs> And uh, so you are a social entrepreneur, Ashoka Fellow, and you are the founder of Bluefish, a consultancy that designs and implements projects that improve the socio-economic dynamics of heritage, cultural, and that work also on the re resilience of local communities. Um, I mean, you have done and you are still doing a lot of things, but I just would like also to say that you are, because he's one of the partners, you founded uh, the Ben Gassem, a boutique hotel and a cultural catalyst in the Medina of Tunis. So you have the rest of the very nice biography uh, in your program. So Leila, as you understood with the introduction of Johan, was associated uh, also to the making of this program to provide also input. And we ask Leila for the two uh, morning to provide uh, some takeaway from your side from the discussion and also in relation maybe with the comment and the question of the participant. So the floor is yours. Thank you for this introduction. Uh, it's, a, it's a challenge because there was a lot of good ideas and I only have 15 minutes to, uh, to wrap it up. So um, as a Tunisian citizen, I would like to first apologize to everyone who had a hard time to come. Uh, especially Reem Qasim, I hope our governments will uh, love Om Kalthum as we do and uh, in Sabri. <laughs> um, so uh, I present my apologies to everyone who had a problem coming in. So the first panel was a very rich panel um, led by our friend Johan and um, contributions with, um, with Yukuna and Selim. And, um, and uh, Yukuna had a very important point um, about the artistic and cultural um, power um, of impact, uh, but we need to be careful how the power is used and um, the metrics, um, who's using it and who's impacting it. Uh, but also what's more important is to think of environment in a, in a holistic approach. So it's not just animals and trees, it's also humans. Uh, we need to have empathy, uh, we need to have... Um, uh, solidarity, we need to think of um, um, humanity to be uh, comfortable in the ecosystem that uh, we're, we're talking about. Um, um, access to culture was also um, important and I very much approach the, um, ap appreciate what Salim uh, shared about uh, really making culture accessible. Um, you know, um, mobility is uh, has an economic uh, um, um, economic result and uh, bringing culture, uh, perform cultural performance closer to people um, makes it accessible but makes it also, um, it's like rethinking mobility and uh, this is very important. And um, also South-South uh, exchange of culture um, is a big question because as we all know, for us, uh, getting to Europe is probably easier than getting to other parts of Africa. And, uh, of course, I say this with, uh, <laughs> with a little bit of um, um, almost uh, feeling uncomfortable saying it. Um, the second panel was very interesting, also uh, heroically led by uh, Johan again. And um, thanks to Arij and Karim for sharing uh, many insights. Um, what was shared was important. It's the, really the um, economic and political priorities um, that come into play when you try to position, uh, when you try to discuss environmental uh, priorities. Um, the, both institutions are worried about creating inclusive solutions that incorporate um, the artists and the artisans um, their way of, um, of thinking, but also uh, their economic challenges and security challenges. Um, finally, also the, the funding sources um, play, try to incorporate all these challenges in the, uh, in the process. Um, 
Karim explained the, um, the challenge of raw material and the, um, the environmental costs of, uh, of some raw material, but also explained that their approach is experimental, um, allowing for um, a solution to be created as a journey uh, for long-term relationships to be, uh, to be created. Um, and uh, also Arij explained how they try to um, not to impose any solutions but also express the importance of uh, co-creation of solutions. Um, and also Arij explained the, the big we that we're talking about. Um, it can only be um, effective if each smaller we uh, are, um, understand their limitations and their possibilities and um, and um, and also I'm very touched by what Arij said about the Arab world. Yes, uh, that's that's also another challenge. Uh, the exchange and travel between Arab countries is not that easy. Um, and finally, Arij, um, despite all the regional challenges, I think. Um, there's still a possibility for collective imagination and creation of uh, solutions for better uh, cultural mobility. Uh, I enjoyed the story that Karim shared, and that exactly is uh, the core of mobility, is to see things in different ways, uh, not, just to, um, um, not just to see new things. And uh, I personally love to travel, uh, despite the not a very pleasant experience of getting the visas. And if I may abuse my position as a rapporteur and explain that it's cultural mobility that has had tremendous impact on our culture as Tunisians. We today enjoy the, the Malouf music, which is, was brought by the Andalusians. We enjoy the Stambeli music, which was brought by Sub-Saharan culture. Uh, we are proud of our Baklewa that, was mi that migrated with the Ottomans. Um, so, and I think this is the beauty of cultural mobility, is to create empathy between cultures and uh, exchange for uh, a much wider um, cultural experiences in our region. Thank you. <laughs>